Hello everyone. Uh, here to talk to you about balance recovery in the Seraphis protocol. Let's start with the warm up. Uh, what is the transaction protocol and what is the enote paradigm? So an enote is just an amount that is owned by someone um, in Bitcoin and in the past and, and most of the time that these are called outputs or transaction outputs. A transaction on a blockchain is just a It's an event that consumes enotes and creates new enotes. So the amounts in old enotes are consumed and transferred into new enotes that have new owners. And the blockchain is just a series of transactions uh, transferring funds between users. When we're talking about balance recovery, users want to know how how what is the total amount that they can currently spend so they need to identify new enotes that are that appear in the ledger that are that are owned by them and also uh, locate what where and or if any of the enotes that they've received in the past have been spent their balance is simply the the amount recorded in enotes that have not been spent yet that they own. When we're we're actually thinking about how to how do we design enotes, um, and also hidden from different tiers of like wallet tiers. So the the there can be like different different um, different tiers of of, of ability to read information in the enote. Um, a, a third, a third, at, or a third goal that hasn't hasn't really been uh, thought of too much in the past is the, the principle of least astonishment. So, when you discover an enote that you own in the ledger, it should there should not be nothing surprising about that enote. The fact that you own it. Or, and which address owns it? You, you shouldn't. You shouldn't find that enote and then be astonished to discover that it's unspendable due to a previous enote that you received. Stuff like that. We're going to be talking about a lot of cryptography today. So here's some notation. Um, we have elliptic curve points. We have scalars. We have operations. We have generators and we have hash functions. Uh, the the one hash function to really note here is the keyed hash, which we don't have with CryptNote. So uh, I am we with Jamtis we add this keyed this keyed hash interface uh, for very explicit um, ways of hashing things with with a with a well defined secret key. So let's recap how CryptoNote and RingCT works. We have uh, sub addresses. So this is this is like the the the, the frontier of CryptoNote is sub addresses. Uh, we have the, the private view key, the private spend key, and when we're making an address, we include a sub address index. This way, this way, a user, a user who has these two private keys, view and spend key, can generate many, many sub addresses from those keys, and funds re received to any of those sub addresses can be um, discovered with the same private keys. So this this uh, improves the the privacy attributes of the sub address system by allowing users to send out different addresses to different people. And then those people, um, if they talk to each other, they won't necessarily know that uh, the addresses are from the same person. So in practice, we do this by extending, extending 
the spend key with the sub with a sub address index with a modifier that's a hash of the view key and the index. And then our, our view key, so we have the two public keys in the address itself that's, that's sent out to other people. We have the, the spend key so-called, which is actually a Diffie-Hellman base, base key, or it's, it's used as a Diffie-Hellman base key as we'll see. And then we also have the view key, which is the Diffie-Hellman pub key that, um, that will play a big role in balance, balance recovery as, as we go forward. So the, the important thing to, to note here is how the private view key is itself a Diffie-Hellman uh, exchange with the spend key, just directly with the, the view key itself without any uh, address index modifier. So when we construct a crypto note or ring CTE note, this, this is the entire process here. So we have, we're given an address, an amount, an optional payment ID, and the output index of this E note uh, within the transaction where it's going to be placed. So we begin by creating an ephemeral pub key uh, between uh, an ephemeral key and the recipient's uh, spend public key. And then we also create, so this is, this is normally you'd, you'd see an ephemeral key that looks like RT times the generator G. But in, the, in our case, we're, we're making the, the public key multiplied by the user, a user defined Diffie Hellman base pub, public key as the user uh, spend key. And, and the, the important thing with this is uh, it allows the, the Diffie-Hellman base key to be a function of the sub-address index. So you can have many, you can generate many um, well, well, we'll get to that. So, so then the, the Diffie-Hellman derivation, this is the, the normal Diffie-Hellman thing that you usually see is, so we have the ephemeral key times the actual, the user the user Diffie-Hellman uh, key, which is the, the view key in this case. And then we hash that to get a uh, the secret of the of the sender-receiver relationship. And then we use this then we use this the sender receiver secret to to finish constructing the E note. So we have we have a, an amount which is a Peterson commitment between the, the secret and the amount or the amount masked by the secret. We have the amount itself encoded by the secret for the, the recipient to later decrypt or decode or whatever. We have the the one-time address it, uh, which is which represents ownership of the e-note. So you have to sign with with this address to prove ownership of the e-note when you're going to spend it. We we do this by simply extending the the user spend key with the the, the sender receiver secret. Uh, the, a recent addition is the view tag, which which uh, well as we'll see speeds up the the balance recovery process uh, at the cost of only one byte. And we also have the 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 payment ID, which is it's just like an eight, uh, an eight byte string in, in encrypted with the sender receiver secret or sorry, just the, the Diffie-Hellman derivation. We save, a, we save a hash by just directly putting the, the derivation in there. And since the, the address, uh, right now only one encrypted payment ID per transaction is allowed. So only one uh, recipient can use the payment ID. So the, the final e note is the, the address, the commitment, the encrypted amount, view tag, and the optional uh, encrypted payment ID, and then plus the the ephemeral base or ephemeral pub key, which can be which will be used for balance recovery. So here's the crypto note key image. Uh, it's a bit hard to read, but here we'll go through it. So we have the key image equals. So these are all the. This is the private key that's attached to the one-time address. 
so we have the um right right we have the the sender receiver secret here i think i'm missing a hash in there but we have the sender receiver secret which is a based on the the diffie hellman derivation we have the the output index itself then we have the sub address extension and the spend key so when you you need all the all this information kind of each each chunk of the the key provides a uh, different has different functions so we have this the spend key which is the like the core the core uh, ownership me mechanism for the e note so you must have the, the spend key in order to sign on a key image and also on the one time address then we have the 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 index the index extension which is used to create make make sure that all your sub addresses are separated from each other and uh, indistinguish or and not uh, have no distinguishable relationship then we have the sender receiver extension or secret extension which which um, hides hides the the, the more the static sub address spend key from observers so so to create so to create a, a key image you need all of these private keys uh, because we have because these are all multiplied by hash to point of the of the one-time address so you have this like interdependency between the key image and the one one-time address uh, that that, that means you have to have all of these pieces in order to create the key image all right, so now we get into uh, balance recovery. So, view scanning is where is the is the is the part you can do with just the, the private view key and knowing the 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 addresses public uh, spend key here, as we can see. So the first thing you have to do is pre-generate all the spend keys that you for sub addresses you think might own funds for your wallet uh right so actually we're, we're so this is the case when we're given we're given some e-note that we're scanning up here at the top scan info so we have an e-note with all of the e-note info we have the uh, ephemeral key and we have the out, outputs in, index in the transaction so then so we pre-generate pre all the keys that we might might that might that might own this e-note we we create a Diffie-Hellman derivation with the ephemeral key stored in the transaction. So we multiply the ephemeral key with by our our private view key um, to get the the derivation. We compute the view tag as a simple hash directly of the Diffie-Hellman derivation. If the view tag doesn't match, then we immediately abort. So this is this is how this is an efficiency improvement was recently at or that should be go live in the next hard fork um, the view tag is one byte so one out of every only one out of every 256 outputs on the blockchain uh, that are not owned by you will fall through this this uh, trap here um, and then so then so then after so the the reason we add this is because the, the following operations are quite ex, are expensive. So if we can skip those for a lot of out, outputs that we don't own, then we can save some time during scanning. So the next the next step, we, we take a hash of the Diffie-Hellman derivation to get our, our, the secret. And then we test the one-time address stored in the e-note to see if it might be um, one of our if it might if it matches one of our pre-generated um, sub address spend keys if it's not in the pre-generated list then we abort so this is a this is a violation of the principle of least astonishment because we might own this you know and it just so happens that the the it's spend the spend the sub address spend key that owns it is not in the pre-generated list this impacts some users, not 
not most users, but a few users. But it's it's kind of a a small annoyance that uh, that would be better. It would be, be be better if we didn't have that annoyance. I guess you could say. And then you can also decrypt the uh, payment ID. I think you ignore it if it's null. Part two, amount recovery. So at this point, we probably, if, if, we, if we've passed the, the sub address spend key test, then pretty much all the time we own the node. But just in case, we decrypt the amount and recompute the, the amount commitment just to make sure that it's not malformed. And the result is our enote that is owned. We do not have the key image at this point because the key image um, requires the, the spend key, the private spend key. So that, that, that's view, view scanning with crypto note. So now we can move on to Seraphis, a balance recovery. Seraphis is, in a lot of ways, what I'm going to be talking about from now on is similar to CryptoNote. There are a few critical differences. So one, one, one critical difference is the construction of the one-time address in a Seraphis enote. So well, where before the one-time address was some key times the generator G, now we have two generators, X and U. Um, okay, and then we have two private keys within the one-time address. And then, so the amount commitments are the same as in ring CT, uh, as well as the encoded amount. When we're when we're going to spend an enote, we we make some some more changes as well. So we we're spending. So we we make a a representation of the enote we're spending as a, so ma a mask of the one-time address, masked version of the one-time address and the amount commitment. But those two are not the subject of this talk. The key image, however, is an important thing to look at. So the key image construction in Seraphis is the, the, the U from one-time address, the U key divided by the X key times U. So, this construction will be important to talk more about later. Um, so an outline of balance recovery. As usual, we try to reproduce the one-time address. We decode the amount. We try to reproduce the amount commitment. And then now we, we have this added step of computing the key image and storing it for later. So all, this whole first recover own step can be done with the with the main the main view key that we're going to talk about, um, and then after this recover recover own step, you can identify spent keys by simply looking looking at all the enotes in the ledger and matching key images against the the locally stored key images, which were generated by the the view key. So all of this can be done. This whole page can be done with just the view key that we'll talk about. So in practice, uh, we use the the Jamtis addressing scheme to implement um, to implement all this stuff here. So all these this is kind of uh, not well defined, but with Jamtis it'll become well defined. Uh, I want to be clear from the the start that Jamtis can be is most of what is in Jamtis could be applied to uh, CryptNote and Ring CT, with a, a few small things that are geared for towards the Seraphis construction of one-time addresses and key images. Okay, so here's the key structure for Jamtis. It's a little more complicated, but having these extra keys gives us more fine-grained control over uh, information access during the balance recovery process. So we have the master key, which is equivalent to a spend, the private spend key. And then we have the view balance key. Uh, so these two keys are the main keys. And then we have some derived keys. We have a generate address secret, 
which uh, spawns a cipher tag secret. We have a find received key and we have an unlock amounts key. Uh, I'll, I'll note that the un unlock amounts key was just added two days ago, uh, but I think it, it's important. So these are the wallet tiers you get with these all these different keys combined. So we get the master key, which is the, the, the fully powered wallet. We have the, the view all wallet tier. We have the view received wallet tier, which can only only view incoming uh, e-notes that are not self not, not self sends, which we'll we'll get into later. You have the find received key, which is uh, pre processed scanning of the chain, and we have the generate address tier, which can only make addresses for your account. And I think Justin is going to be talking about this more later. Or these these tiers and how they impact users. All right. So we have here we have Jamtis addresses. Um, instead of instead of one. <clears throat> okay, so the Jamtis addresses really revolve revolve are really kind of a compact um they, they contain all of the 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 information access tiers in a very like compact form so it'll take a little while to unpack but we'll get there so first note the sub the address index so we we're, we're, we're doing away with the sub address terminology and we're, we're just talking about addresses now just for uh simplicity i guess so we have the address index modifiers which are very similar to sub i mean they're basically the same thing as sub address modifiers they allow allow us to have many addresses uh with the with the same uh base um key, key structure or off of the same user keys so we're going to ex be extending our our address keys with the the, in, the index modifiers. So here 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 we have our address contents. So in Jamtis we have three public keys instead of two. And in the reason I mean the reason the reason for this is to to give us more fine grained control control over information access. But the thing that the thing to note here is that the spend key is no longer the Diffie Hellman base key of the user. Instead, we we separate that out into a a, th a third key, uh, which is a function of the index the index modifier and the unlock amounts key. As we'll see, we're going to be using a reverse Diffie Hellman, uh, as I call it, I guess, to uh, to control amount amount information access. So again, we can start by looking at the Diffie Hellman base help key. We have the, as I said, the index modifier and the unlock amounts key. And then the Diffie Hellman key pub key of the user is the find received key is, is basically Diffie Hellman with the the base key using our find received key. So the only difference is the added find receive key and so this is this is very similar to the crypto note uh, address view key which is the private view key multiplied by the spend key so in this case we have the find receive key multiplied by the base key base pub, pub key here we also have the spend key which is um which is we have the master key times u we have the the view balance key, so the core, the most they're the the central view key times x, and then with an additional address index uh, modifier, or the the spend key extension up here is down here. So we have two two extensions or two modifiers. The spend key extension goes on the spend key, and the address priv key goes on the the Diffie Hellman stuff. So 
The fourth piece of an address is this address index tag. So this is this is this has an important role throughout the balanced recovery process. So the address index, index tag is simply you cipher the address index uh, with a small Mac and then store that with the address. So right now I have implemented a 16 byte um, address index with a two byte Mac. And the reason for such a large, a large index tag, so 18 bytes, is with, with a 16 byte address index, you can um, re reliably and confidently generate any random index without any like fear or worry about encountering um, a collision. Um, it, it's also it also matches the UUID uh, expectation or size, which is 16 bytes. So that hopefully is compatible with the uh, the 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 use case or more use cases, I guess. And then a, a two byte Mac is a like forward compatibility or forward thinking size to uh, improve performance. So here we have a the construction of a a Jamtis normal E note. So Jamtis with Jamtis, we have two kinds of E notes. We have normal E notes and we have self send E notes. And uh, um, I'll get into why we have that distinction uh, later. So if we're, give, we're given a, an ad, a user's address, which has the address keys and the address tag, we have an amount and we have this input, input context. So the input context is a is a, an interesting addition, I'll say for now. So the input context, normally it's just a, had, a hash of all the key images that are inputs to the transaction that will create this E note. If it's a Coinbase transaction, then the, it'll be a hash of the block, uh, the block height of this Coinbase E note. Right, so we have the, the normal, uh, of, ephemeral key of the e-note, which is uh, ephemeral, ephemeral pri private key times the, the, uh, the base key, the base Diffie-Hellman key here, as we see, the base key specified by the user. Instead of, instead of the generator like you normally get with Diffie-Hellman, you have the user-defined base key for the, uh, the ephemeral public key. You also have the Diffie-Hellman derivation, which is uh, the, the the secret in the Diffie-Hellman exchange between the uh, the ephemeral private key and the the Diffie-Hellman public key defined by in the user address. You have a sender receiver secret, which is a function of the Diffie-Hellman derivation. Uh, we also include the ephemeral public key for robustness, and we and it includes the input context. So the, our sender receiver secret is bound to the inputs of the transaction. Doing this may, ensures that all of your since 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 input contexts are always unique because key images and Coinbase heights are always unique. Your sender receiver secrets are always unique. This means your, your resulting, the resulting pieces of your e-note will always be unique on the chain, unless your e-note is malformed. But if the e-note is malformed, then the user will not discover that e-note when they go to scan the chain. Okay, so we have the, so let's get back to this. We have the, as usual, we have the amount and commitment, the encoded amount, the one-time address. Um, these three are basically the same as what we get with uh, ring CT, with uh, an extension or with uh, the sender receiver secret. Although the one-time address, we, we include the, the amount commitment 
bound into the one-time address to ensure that even in contexts where the, the input context is malformed, but the user, user acquires that input context from a malicious source of ledger data. So like the like a, a third party scanner or whoever is feeding your um, your node information or whatever. If they give you if they collaborate with uh, an eNote constructor to give you a bad input context that you discover and you you say, I believe I own this, even though the the in reality the input context doesn't match the inputs of the transaction and are actually matching the inputs of a different transaction, which which would cause which could could allow the sender receiver secret to be a duplicate of of what was of what could be found in another transaction. Even in that case, the one time address will only be duplicated if the amount commitment itself is duplicated. So only if the exact same amount is in this e note will the one time address as, as in the the previous the other transaction that I've been alluding to will the one-time address be duplicated this means that if there are duplicate e nodes in the chain their amounts are guaranteed are guaranteed to be to be the same from the in or if if a user is is able to discover duplicate e nodes it's guaranteed that their amounts will be the same. I guess I'll say that. All right, so we also have the, we encrypt the address tag and put it in the e-note and we also have the view tag as usual. So now we can talk about self-send e-notes. So these are, when you construct a transaction, most of the time you add a change output. Sometimes you add a dummy output but these are all things that you create yourself um, and send to yourself, really. So we can we have we have the power to customize the construction of these e notes to uh, reduce um, to to have to have more uh, to have better control of information recovery. Uh, and down, which we'll talk, we'll talk about later. So here, here I put asterisks by the, the, the components that are constructed differently. So we have the, the sender receiver secret is, is different. So in this case, we do not create a Diffie-Hellman ex exchange at all. We do not, or we do not create a Diffie-Hellman derivation aside from in the view tag down at the bottom there. Just for the view tag is the derivation created. For the sender receiver secret, there's no derivation. Instead, we, we do a keyed hash of some context information. So we, the, the type of the self-send e-note, the ephemeral pub key, which is stored in the e-note, and the input context are bound up with the the view balance key. This means you can the the recipient the uh, the recipient who created it for himself can reconstruct the sender receiver secret without doing a Diffie Hellman exchange. This lets him. Oh, I've actually forgot to talk about something. We have in the amount commitment and encoded amount, we include this. The, the foundation, you could call it the foundation of the Diffie-Hellman exchange. So the, the Diffie-Hellman base base key or reverse Diffie-Hellman key, which is uh, the, the ephemeral private key times the generator G. So this is, this is the, this is, so basically the Diffie-Hellman, uh, let's see, the ephemeral pub key can be considered a, Reverse poke a reverse ephemeral key of the of this uh, this key that's that gets baked into the amount commitment and encoded amount. So the the user's private key to go from the ephemeral private public public key to the to the this baked this baked in key 
is uh, one over the unlock amounts key, which we can see here. So, or one over the unlock amounts key times the address private key. Oops, wrong direction. So, so it, it's kind of a, a, a bi-directional ephemeral exchange, I guess you could say. But th that's not present here in the self-send enotes because uh, the sender receiver secret itself is is bound to the view balance key, which is like the master the master of all viewing. So we don't need to bake that in. Um, right. So we have the, the amount commitment encoded amount. The one time address is the same. Here, in this case, we we do a raw encryption of the address tag of the address index instead of encrypting the the you know, or the uh, the address's address tag because the sender receiver secret is is bound again to the the the, the master view balance key or the, the the core view balance key so we can just raw encrypt the the address index um, and get get the same properties that we expect the okay so yeah, then we have the view tag, which is the same as in the normal, the normal e note. We have the Diffie Hellman key that goes into the view tag, and then the Diffie Hellman or Diffie Hellman derivation that goes into the view tag again. I'll also note that the in both cases the the encrypted address tag and the view tag are bound to the one time address, and this this helps ensure. Uh, uniqueness uh, in all cases or in all in pretty much all cases so the final e note we have as as discussed the one term address amount commitment encoded amount address encry encrypted address tag view tag and ephemeral pub key all right now we can we have, we have the jam disk keys or key images in this case, it's different from how what we find in CryptoNote. So we have all of the all of the the pieces that are related to viewing are on the denominator, and the numerator is the master key. So the the important thing here is the, the if you know the master key times u, it's just a public key, a static public key, then if you have the view balance key, you can reconstruct all of the things on the numerator and then do an inverse multiplied by your uh, your store, your pre-stored uh, master public key thing. And then you, you get the key image. So this is how we separate viewing and sign uh, the the requirements for viewing and signing from each other to view you need the view balance and this public key to sign you need view balance and the ma master private key in order to sign on you in the key image and then so the key image is also bound to all this other information the amount commitment the ephemeral key the index of the address and the input context of the transaction I see we're running out of time, but I'll just keep plugging away. So that so we have the a two output optimization to speed up balance recovery. So this is something that we also have with uh, the current protocol with Ring CT. Um, basically, most tra most transactions only have two outputs: the destination, a normal destination, and a change sending funds back to yourself. Uh, in some cases, you also you have a, instead a dummy amount, which is like a dummy a zero amount, a zero amount change, I guess. So for these cases, we can optimize by only putting one ephemeral public key in the transaction. Instead of one per output, we just have one that's shared by the two outputs. This can be done when the second output is a self send so something you're sending yourself because in those cases you know 
um, you know the find received key, so you can you can like rearrange rearrange in order to create the uh, the uh, the Diffie Hellman derivation. So you get the ephemeral key for the non-self-send, so the normal destination. And then you just multiply your self-send or your, your own find received key by that other ephemeral public key to get the, the Diffie-Hellman or the, uh, the Diffie-Hellman derivation for your transaction, which is used for, which is for self-sends, it's only used for the, the view tag. So, what if um, is there is there a risk of duplication, uh, which would impact privacy by reuse by using a two um, reusing the ephemeral public key? In our case, the duplication can. So in the first place, we're only doing this if we have at least one self send in a two output. So duplication can only occur. If we have two of the two self sends that are the same type, so we put since we put the type of the self send in as a domain separator, the the sender receiver secret is bound to the 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 type the type itself. So we'll never get it. We can only get duplicated send to receiver secrets if we have the same type of self sends in the in a, in a transaction so we we need two two same type self send outputs um transact in transactions key images or not key image sorry one or one time addresses the one time addresses of outputs can must all be unique within a single transaction not within within the ledger, but because that uh, um, invites DDoS, but within a transaction, you can, you mu all the one-time addresses must be unique, which means here, since we, we the one-time address and the two tags are bound to the one-time address, all of those must be unique, but the amount commitment could be duplicated if you have the same, uh, the same type self send. Uh, but which is easy enough to uh, avoid by banning two same type self sends. Uh, most of the time, you'll have you, it doesn't make sense to have two change outputs anyway. So this is an easy thing to enforce. Uh, note that you could have two same type self sends with different amounts, and that might look like uh, not not you or it might look like. So the, the, the amount commitments are not identical, so maybe it's okay. But since amounts are so small, uh, you, you can br brute force equal or equality of the, the mask itself. So it, it, it kind of doesn't matter. All right, so these are all the rules for uh, when you can add a, an additional, or when you should add an additional output um, in order to ensure that all right, so what I'm trying to get at with this slide is the, the top thing here. So we have, we want all transactions to have at least two outputs and at least at least one self send output, and this is an important optimization that that Justin um, helped me find. Uh, we want when we're looking for e notes, we, or sorry, when we're looking for our the e notes that we have spent when we're trying to identify which ones we have spent we only want to really look in transactions that we created so we only want to look so we if if all of our transactions that we create have at least one self send this ensures that at least one output will be a view tag match which means we only need to if if we if we if we follow this rule and then we only look in transactions that have at least one view tag match uh, look at the key images in those transactions then 
the when we're um, then we only need to look at those key images to find all the e notes that we have spent. Yeah, I realize I've gone over time, so I'm going to keep going until someone stops me. So this this means when so the, the, this this optimization it, this is an important optimization uh, that reduces the amount of data that needs to be transmitted when we're doing remote scanning. All right, so part five, we'll talk about the actual workflow for balance recovery, which is more complicated than crypto note because we have more, more, more fine-grained control over the information access. So the first piece of scanning is find received. This is where you only have the find received key, this, this private KFR here, private key. This is a like a pre-processing step for uh, during for scanning. This is the most expensive piece, by far the most expensive piece of scanning is this pre-processing step. So what we do is we, we we make our um, our Diffie-Hellman derivation as usual, and so this this Diffie-Hellman derivation will be the same for normal and self sends. So the the next step where we do the view tag check will be the same. It will behave the same for normal outputs and self sends. Your normal e notes and self sends. Importantly, if our transaction has um, has has two outputs, then uh, we'll only compute the, the Diffie-Hellman derivation once for that transaction. So that's that's where the two output uh, uh, optimization comes in. We only do this Diffie-Hellman derivation once for a two output transaction. So once we got the der derivation, we make our view tag, we abort if it if it fails. Uh, if, if we can't reproduce it. And then we create the normal sender receiver secret. And we use this to decrypt the, the encrypted address tag that's stored in the, e, in the e note on the ledger. So we have, we now have a nominal address tag. The, the find received key itself can't, can't decrypt or decipher the address tag to find the address index inside it but the address tag itself is a static value for the for the address that owns the e note so it's possible for the find received uh whoever has the find received key to match address tags against uh a set of saved or known addresses owned uh, that the user has this can be used to notify um a non-local notify a non-local user when they've um, potentially received an output by by matching the address tag against a predefined list. Uh, right. So now we have view balance scanning, the normal process. So this is the first thing you do when you received an e-note that was flagged by the find receives process. So at this point, this, this, at this point, um, normally use the view balance scan. Uh, so, so I, I won't get into the deeply into the, uh, the, uh, the other, the other tiers, but they're, they're noted on the, the, the left side there. So, here we have our, our the view balance private key and the the master public key, and we're going to we we can use of course we can use the view balance key to derive all the other private keys that go into a balance recovery. So we have a nominal e or a nominally owned e note flagged by the the find received process, and we want to see is it actually owned by us. So the first thing we do is we decipher the address tag to get the address index. And it turns out this is extremely 
efficient step because deciphering is a extremely fast compared to um, elliptic curve operations. So we decipher decipher the, the, the nominal tag that was provided to us by the, the find received scan. And if deciphering fails, then we abort. So since the Mac is two bytes here, we uh, at this point, we've gone through three whole bytes of, of filtering. Um, so pretty much the vast majority of the time, if we get through those three bytes of filtering, so the view, the view tag and then the, the address tag, if we go through, through those two steps, we probably own the enote. So the, the rest of the scanning is, is not done for very many of the enotes in the, in the ledger that we don't own, I guess you could say. So, so deciphering the address tag has two, has, has really two important uh, impacts on the scanning process. One is the Mac is, a, is an important, important filter for efficiency when, when handling information received from the find received uh, scan process, which greatly impacts uh, the speed of balance recovery for like a, a local user who's downloading pre-scanned uh, pre information from a find received service or whatever. And also it, it gives us the, the address index itself, which means we can do the rest of balance recovery directly from this address index without needing to have a pre-generated list of, uh, of addresses to compare against, since we can just use the address index itself directly to reconstruct everything. All right, so let's continue on. So we have the, we make the sender receiver secret uh, as you'd expect to be created. Oh, so in this case, we can we can either reuse uh, the the Diffie the Diffie Hellman derivation if we still have it, or we can re recreate it if it's uh, if it's been lost. So we don't want to we don't want to transmit the Diffie Hellman or the sender receiver secret over the wire. Um, so the find received information just doesn't include it. And it's very cheap to, once we get through the, the address index um, filter, it's very cheap to reconstruct the, the diffie hellman derivation. So we get the sender receiver secret and we we use the, the deciphered address index to reconstruct the, the one-time address uh, of the e-note that we're supposedly that we, we, we might own. If we, if we successfully, if we fail to reconstruct the one-time address, then we abort because I guess the filtering didn't, didn't succeed, so we don't own this. So here we have a dashed line uh, with uh, an ugly little note that says, find received plus generate address. So up to this line, you can, you can get up to this line with just the find received key and the generate address key. So, um, right, because because with the with the generate address, we have we can reconstruct the the one time address uh, with just the the spend key extension and the sender the nominal or the sender receiver secret because we have the kvbx plus kmu. Um, so you can't so to so if you combine. Like if you combine these two wallet tiers, you you only get up to this point in the scanning process. This, so the the addition of the unlock amounts key was an important uh, important thing to do because without the unlock amounts key, you could go all the way down to this other the second blue line below the amount recovery on the, uh, which, which I'll continue talking about later in a bit. So the unlock amounts key gets you down to this line, um, and then adding or acquiring the unlock amounts key gets you down to this line. But without the unlock amounts key, you only get to this line here, where you identify which which address index owns the e note, which 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 matches against the what you'd expect from uh, the power of those two keys.
So the generate address can look at addresses and the find receive key can um, show you the nominal the nominal address of the of of an enote that was constructed normally. So non non self sends only normal normal enotes. All right. So now we have continuing on. We have the amount recovery. So here we have we have this baked key that I was talking about. This this kind of uh, reverse reverse Diffie Hellman exchange with the inverse of the of the uh, of K of K three in the address the the Diffie Hellman base key of the user of the recipient. We we do the inverse on the ephemeral key to get this this the the ephemeral base base key or whatever it, it should be called the baked key in order to uh, decipher the amounts and reconstruct the amount commitment. So this 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 reverse Diffie Hellman has two important does two important things. One, it it gates amount uh, the ability to read the amounts on the unlock amounts key, in addition, of course, to the the generate address key for the address index modifier. It also so in addition to gating information access, it defeats the Janus attack that is that uh, the CryptoNote is or CryptoNote with sub addresses sub addresses is vulnerable to. So the as a recap, the Janus attack is basically you you can you can associate two sub addresses with each other if you mal if you mal maliciously construct uh, an enote you can you can construct it from components of two different sub addresses and then if the if if the user recovers recovers that enote and then notifies the sender that they received it then the sender will know that the two sub addresses they use to construct the enote uh, are from the same user. In, in our case, we reconstruct everything from the the address index itself. That, so the address index that we got from the that we got from the address tag is used to reconstruct the the one-time address and and the amount commitment. So it's impossible to combine two two separate addresses to construct an enote that can be successfully recovered. So so that, that's how we so this kind of this little trick with the, the inverse Diffie Hellman is very powerful. Okay, so up to the so then up to this blue line is what what a payment validator can do. So this is the uh, the find received tier, wallet tier. So we have, so with the payment validator, they have the generate address, find received and unlock amounts key. And then this public key that, that can be used for the reconstructing the amount, for the one-time address. So up to this, up to this point, so the, the payment validator can find all normal enotes sent to the unit user and read, read the, the address index and the amount. Oh, another thing about the address index, since it's 16 bytes, this lets us uh, more easily deprecate the payment ID system because there's it kind of like it's kind of like squeezes the payment ID into the address index itself. And then, well, Justin will talk about that more later, I think. But so, continuing on, key images. Now. This is the only. This is the thing that only the the view balance key can do, since our one time address is the on the 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 x the x segment contains the view balance key. In order to move this this chunk here that's on the x, invert it onto the 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 u segment. 
uh, here with key image. So key image is the inverse of all this the viewing stuff times the the static uh, spend key. So if you have the view balance key, then you can construct the key image. And then, so if the key image appears on chain, then the enote is spent. And you can know that with the view balance key, which of course can be used, as, as I said here, drive all the other keys, unlock all the other information, all the rest of the information, and give you the, the key image. So the result of this is the enote, ephemeral key, input context, amount, index, key image, and, and you can just say that it's a normal type because you've succeeded this far. So now we have continuing with self send balance recovery. So now, so now we have, so, well, I'll get into how, how we, the, the cycle that gets us here in a, in a few slides, but so now, so we're going to look at an enote that, okay, it might be a self-send. So it's a, it's a view tag match in a transaction with one of our key images. So it's a key image from uh, an enote that pr prior to this enote, some prior enote that we own produced a key image that showed up in this transaction. And this transaction has a view tag match Um, so we know it could be a self-send. So now we're going to look at it as a potentially a self-send. So, okay. We, so yeah, so we, we just have a, we can just say we have a normal enote with a ephemeral key and input context. If we got information from the find receive step, the only additional piece would be the nominal address tag, but that's not going to be used for this piece of scanning. So we, to the thir first thing we do is we just uh, do a hash, a keyed hash of the ephemeral key input context and a, a, a self-send type that we're going to test. Because there can be multiple types. So we have we have change, we have dummies, dummy self-sends for if there's a zero amount change, or uh, self-spends where we're like churning money to ourselves. We have these three distinctions right now. Um, so we ha we'd have to test all three, but it's it's a cheap thing to do because we the next thing we do is after we have this, the sender receiver secret, we raw raw decrypt the the address tag. So there's no deciphering in here. We just raw decrypt it into the address index. And if the MAC is is zero as expected, then or then we continue on. If it's invalid, then we can try a new self send type. So these two things are very cheap. We just do a hash and an XOR for, for all the types, except for the occasional case where the Mac doesn't fail, even though we don't own it. In which case we'll do a reconstruction of the one-time address. It's just the same thing as we had with a, a normal scanning with uh, the reconstruction. If this fails, then we abort or try a new self-send type. If it doesn't fail, then we pre probably own the enote unless something horrible happened during uh, construction of the enote. So now we do amount recovery. Uh, there's no baked key. I guess I guess there's no Janus attack here unless, yeah, Janus doesn't make sense. I don't know why I have that note there, but there's no baked key, key here because the, not, the sender receiver secret is already a function of the view balance key. So we don't really, uh, we already have, if we got, if we can, can get this far, then, um, there's, there's no, there's no question about information access because only the view balance key can do this self send scanning piece. Uh, right. So we, we do, Decrypt the amount, reconstruct the amount commitment just to make sure it's well well formed, and recreate the key image as we did before. Do the key image check, and if it if if we find the key image somewhere, then then the enote is spent. Uh, yeah, 
So the result, same same result, E note, thermal key, input context, amount, index, key image. And in this case, we have the self send type that, that uh, succeeded. All right, so now we, we have the last two slides uh, where it all co like comes together into the process by which we process the ledger, the information in the ledger. So we, the way I, I implemented it is a, as a scanning of chunks. So we have a, a chunk, which is just some some set of, of transactions, either from a range of blocks, or maybe it's the transaction pool, or maybe it's some off-chain context. Uh, that we're using for like um, like atomic swaps or something. So we we're, we're, we find receive scanned this chunk of transactions, and the result is the res, is the result of find receive scanning all the enotes in those transactions. So we have we have basic enotes or basic enote records, which are just enotes that passed view tag matches, and they also include the nominal address tag for the, the, the find receive step created, and also some context information about where those where those uh, unit records came from. And then from the transactions that have view tag matches, so all the all the enotes in the found enotes vector, for each of those transactions, we record the key images And along with uh, where they came from. So, so then when we when we go to further process the chunk, so this is the view, the view balance. We're gonna we're now gonna complete or finish scanning the chunk. So, so first we we look at uh, the key. First we look at the key images in the chunk, and we say, are any of the old e notes that we have stored in our local like wallet have any of those been spent in this chunk? If they did, then we store the transaction ID of where those were spent. Then we normal scanned, we, we don't do a normal scan on all the found, the found enotes in the chunk, which is very fast because of the address uh, address tag deciphering. If any of the normal scanned enotes in the chunk are spent, then we store the transaction ID. And then we look at all the transaction IDs that were flagged as having uh, spent spent key images. So the so all the transactions with spent key images are transactions that we constructed. So they might have a self send in them. So we we loop on the stored IDs to scan scan all the view tag matches in those flagged transactions for self send enotes. Again, it's fast because of the address uh, the address tag dis, uh, decryption. If any of the self send e notes are again spent later in the chunk, then uh, then we loop again to to get through all the whole chunk to make sure we didn't miss anything. So that's how we process a chunk. When we're talking about uh, the ledger itself, we're processing one chunk at a time. So, or, so right. Um, so the so it's like a uh, a composition of the the of the chunk processing. So we we, we have a ledger chunk, which is just a an e chunk a chunk of of find receive scanned e notes from a range of blocks. We also record the the block ID of the block that comes before the block range, so that we can check that each chunk is contiguous with the next chunk. When we're scanning, just in case of reorgs that happen during that happen during the scanning process, and also that it allows us to uh, do a contig contiguity check with our locally stored uh, block IDs in case a reorg went into like deeper into uh, the stored blocks that we've already scanned or whatever. All right, so then when we scan, we we just get chunks, chunk, we scan chunks of enotes from the ledger until there are no more chunks. And of course we do chunks instead of just doing the whole thing because uh, just as an efficiency measure. We do con cont contiguity checks and we have to rescan if there are any 
mis uh, contiguity mismatches because that means there was a reorg, so we have to go back and rescan. Uh, there's there's some complications around whether you fully rescan or partially scan. It's kind of an implementation detail. Um, we also, after doing an on-chain loop where we process the entire ledger with uh, consecutive chunks, then we process all the transactions in the transaction pool as one chunk. And then we do another follow-up loop scanning the, the ledger um, in case we, we so we do a follow-up loop in case the unconfirmed chunk is stale. So you could think a so it's an asynchronous process. So a, a a block could sneak in between this on-chain loop and the unconfirmed processing. So we do a follow-up loop just to make sure that uh, there's not there's, there's nothing we missed because we want. We care about the on-chain stuff more than unconfirmed. So it's okay if the unconfirmed is stale. And then with all of the things that we've scanned, we update our local you know, storage. Uh, we, we, we discard all of the, the pre-existing unconfirmed uh, and records that are above the point of alignment with the current chain. And then we re replace and record and update everything. And that's the end. All right.